Hey class, uh, welcome back. We're now going to begin our lecture on chapter two, where we're going to talk about introduction to kinematics. And chapter two will be broken into two sections. The first, just introducing the idea of kinematics, and the second half, talking about our equations of motion, as well as the specific application of kinematics to things um, accelerating vertically under the influence of gravity. So, to get things started, let's just define what kinematics is. So kinematics is really the idea of dealing with motion. Anything to describe the way objects move falls under the idea or the umbrella of kinematics. And if you combine kinematics with the idea of dynamics, which is dealing with how forces affect motion, you put those two things together, kinematics and dynamics, and those together give you the field known as mechanics. So any of you interested in becoming a mechanical engineer, this is all for you pretty much and if you really want to know this entire semester we're going to be dealing with kinematics and dynamics over and over again um, and almost the entirety of what we're covering this semester falls in under either kinematics or dynamics forces as they apply linearly or rotationally how energy affects motion as well as forces and so on so most of this entire semester falls under either kinematics or dynamics so get excited i am all right, so let's do a few quick definitions. So we're going to want to talk about kinematics, so we're dealing with motion. And when we talk about motion, we want to think about the motion of a given object. So here you can see we have a car starting at some initial time. It's going to take off from some initial position and undergo a displacement represented by the Greek letter delta and x. If you notice these x values, all of them have a little hat above it. That represents a vector, which we'll be talking about more in chapter three. But you can notice that our time is not a vector, but our displacement and location position vectors are indeed vector quantities. So anyway, x sub zero is our initial position. x without any subscripts is our final position. And the difference between those two is our overall displacement. So again, to give you a couple kind of quick examples, if you had some object that started at a position of two meters, like that car, for example, if it then moved to a final position of seven meters, its displacement, easy enough, seven minus two, final minus initial, gives you a net displacement of five meters. Now, if your car was to flip around and go back the same exact distance, starting from an initial position of seven meters, going back to a final position of two meters, it would again have a displacement, but this time its displacement would be equal to negative five meters. Oh, and look at that. I found a typo already in my PowerPoint. So let's put that negative sign in there. So it's negative uh, five meters. So there we go. Displacement is negative five meters. Sorry about the typo. Um, okay, good. So that's displacement easy enough. But I want to talk a little bit about speed and velocity because we care not only about where we start and where we end, but we also care about how long it takes us to get from point A to point B, our rate at which we're moving as we go from point A to point B. So first I want to define average speed. And as you can see here, average speed is equal to the distance covered by a given object divided by the time it takes to cover that distance. And if we're using our standard SI units, as we talked about last chapter a little bit, the SI units for speed will give us meters divided by seconds, or meters per second is how we will be measuring the speed of a given object. So let's do a quick example with this. I was born and raised in Reno, Nevada, which as you see here is about 550 miles from Newburgh. Um, which is where George Fox is. I live in Dundee, which is like three miles away from uh, Newburgh. So it's about the same whether I'm coming from home or from school. It's about 550 miles if I were to drive to Reno. Here's the route I would typically take, in case you're curious, as you can see from the maps. Um, so let's say if you add together all the stops, um, the times I'm going through town and the times I'm on freeway, if I took my average speed over that entire time, it's about 25 meters per second. Now, I want you to tell me the number of hours it takes to drive from Newburgh to Reno, Nevada, based on that average speed. So pause the video and try to calculate it for me real quick. All right, I'm continuing, but hopefully you paused and you calculated it. So let's see what we get. If we know average speed is distance over time, 
we want to figure out time, so we need to solve our equation for the amount of time. So time is going to be equal to average speed divided by, or excuse me, the displacement or distance divided by the average speed. So here I took this equation, I multiplied both sides by time, so I had t times v equals delta x, and then I divided by v in order to get this equation here. So time equals my change in position, which is my distance covered, over my average speed. So now we know that the distance, if we start with 550 miles and convert it into meters, it should come out to almost 900,000 meters at 25 meters per second. If you notice, meters will cancel. You'll be left with units of seconds, and we find that it took us 35,400 seconds, or about 9.83 hours, just about 10 hours to drive to Reno from Newburgh, which is about the amount of time it takes. So boom, box were the answer there for you guys. So that is speed. Now let's talk about velocity. We'll get into this in more detail later, but do you happen to know what the difference is between velocity and speed? Well, velocity is really just speed but with direction. So speed is simply how fast you're going. Velocity is how fast you're going and in what direction. So velocity is your displacement divided by elapsed time. Now notice speed was distance over elapsed time. Velocity is displacement over time. So the only difference there is direction. So you care about not only how far you're going or how fast you're going, but also in what direction you're moving. The way we write this out in vector form, velocity, unlike speed, is a vector. So the average velocity vector is equal to your change in position or displacement divided by your change in time. So that's average velocity. Again, our units are meters per second, but we care about direction. So Let's talk now, that's average, what about instantaneous velocity? What does that even mean, instantaneous velocity? Well, instantaneous velocity is the velocity, how fast you're moving, at one single point in time. Averages are great, but on my trip to Reno, for example, my average velocity was 25 meters per second, but there's times where I was going zero meters per second, stopped at a stoplight, and there's other times where I was maybe going 38 meters per second, if I was speeding, maybe not quite. 30 meters per second, 32 meters per second. So what is it at a given point in time? That's the instantaneous velocity. And the way we do that is you take really the average velocity over a very, very, very short period of time. And if you make that period of time so short, if you take the limit as that time approaches zero, what you're really finding is the slope of the position time curve at one instant. And the slope at one instant in time, as you take the limit as your delta t approaches zero, is more commonly known as the derivative. So for those of you with lots of calculus background, the derivative of your displacement with respect to time is your instantaneous velocity. So if you take the limit, as you see here, again in calculus terms, we take the limit as our change in time goes to zero. As this gets really, really, really small, we will get the derivative of our position with respect to time. Now again, velocity is a vector. You don't see the hat here, and I'll explain why a little bit later, but velocity is the derivative of position with respect to time. So what does this look like graphically? Well, here's a position versus time graph, all right? I want you to take a minute, pause the video once again, and I want you to tell me where on this graph is the velocity going to be zero? Where on this graph is the velocity going to be constant? And where on this graph is the velocity going to be changing? I want you to pause and write down your answer to A, B, and C. And I want you to give it to me in terms of the time. You can see the time here. So maybe between you know four and seven seconds, it's zero or whatever your guess is. I'll give you a hint. That's not the right answer. But try it out. Ready? Go. Cool. Coming back, let's figure out what the answer is together. So this is your position versus time graph. If you took the derivative, you're really finding the slope of this line at any given point in time. So if you took the derivative over the entire thing, you would get a velocity versus time graph that looks something like this. So you can see the answer to A, where is the velocity zero? 
Well, it's when this graph here has zero slope. So from zero to one second, as well as from looks like nine to 10 second mark, you have zero slope, so you have zero velocity as you see down here. Where is the velocity constant? Well, you have a constant slope from points B to C, which is from time t equals three seconds to time t equals eight seconds. And where is it changing? Well, it looks like from one to three seconds it's changing, and from about, it's hard to tell, but let's say eight to nine seconds, or eight and a half to nine seconds, it's changing as well, as you can see represented with the derivative. All right, so that's instantaneous velocity. Pretty good stuff. Now let's talk about acceleration. Acceleration is the rate at which velocity is changing. So it's how much you're speeding up or slowing down. Keeping in mind, again, we're dealing with a vector quantity, which we'll talk about what that means in more detail next chapter. But we're now looking at average acceleration being equal to your change in velocity with respect to time. Instantaneous acceleration is found much the same way as being equal to the derivative with respect to time of our velocity vector. All right, so acceleration is derivative of velocity. Velocity is derivative of position, so therefore acceleration is the second derivative of position with respect to time. So let's look at this graphically now. Again, I have the same graph from before, but now this is our velocity versus time graph from the same motion that we described in the last question. I want you to again pause the video here and I want you to tell me where is the acceleration going to be zero, where is it going to be positive, and where is it going to be negative. Pause and try it out. All right, so hopefully you paused. Now let's see what you got. All right, if we want to take a look at the derivative, the graph, this is what it would look like. You can see where is your acceleration zero? Anywhere the slope of velocity is zero. So from one, zero to one second here, we have zero slope, so zero acceleration. Also, from points B to C, from three to eight seconds, again, zero acceleration due to zero slope. And once more, from nine to 10, as we see here, you then have a positive acceleration due to the positive slope from one to three seconds and a negative acceleration due to the negative slope of the velocity versus time graph from eight to nine seconds. So that's the graphical representation as you can see there. Now keep in mind acceleration can get a little bit tricky. All right, here we see an object that starts at rest. A positive acceleration will cause it to gain velocity in the positive direction. So you have a positive acceleration, you gain velocity in the positive direction. Here you have an object with a negative acceleration that's moving in the positive direction. So now it's losing speed in the positive direction, but it continues to move in the positive direction with that negative acceleration. So just because its acceleration is negative does not mean it's moving backwards. It just means its acceleration, the rate at which its velocity is changing, is negative. All right? So don't get confused about the acceleration direction. You can have a positive acceleration where you speed up, gaining speed due to a positive velocity, but you can also have a positive acceleration where you're slowing down because you have a negative velocity that is becoming more positive, so it's getting closer to zero. And same thing, you can have a negative acceleration where you slow down, but you can also have a negative acceleration where you speed up if your object is moving in the negative direction. So be careful with those signs, pay close attention, but that's an introduction to position, velocity, and acceleration, the beginnings of kinematics. And we'll continue with some applications of all this stuff here shortly in the second video on chapter two.